So my name is Ben Hartshorn. I am an engineer here at Honeycomb. I have been uh, helping to build Honeycomb since basically the beginning. Um, I am an engineer here. Uh, most of my work has been on uh, the ingestion side of the product uh, rather than the UI design or the, um, the storage engine. My current task is uh, working on building a product that will uh, do sampling after the traffic hits Honeycomb so that we can apply some more intelligent rules to selecting what uh, events and traces make it into the storage engine. And this is a, this is a thing that we've had client side for a long time. We've had support for uh, clients sending us a subset of traffic and tagging it appropriately so that uh, uh, we really understand how to, how to do all the math and correctly and, and deal with um, all the data we get. Um, but doing it server side is something we've, we've uh, held off on for quite a while. As a developer, I have been building this product. Given that we know that this is going to deploy into Honeycomb, we want to do the initial instrumentation of this service. This, this gives me a good opportunity to build in from the very beginning the instrumentation that we're going to use when it's in production to understand how the service is behaving. Because it means that the same tools I'm using in development are the tools that I'm going to use in production once it's live. Uh, this is a big part of software ownership, uh, a big part of being able to uh, have that continuity of uh, uh, understanding from the time that I'm building the product to the time that it's being deployed. At least in my history, um, in development, I have spent an inordinate amount of time using printf debugging, you know, where you, you put in a sign, you know, I got here, and then another line, I got here. Uh, and that's great for development. It really does not work in production. Using the same tool set from one to the other uh, lets me establish the patterns of understanding uh, what does normal look like, uh, what, how is a service behaving in one place that just carries directly over to the other. Uh, this is my uh, development, development data set. Um, uh, this was from, uh, what, the 18th. So uh, about two weeks ago, I was running an experiment. Um, as you can see, there, there's not a lot of data here, right? This is not, you know, like a, a, a high, high volume graph. I'm going to add a breakdown on uh, name just to, to give a, a feeling of, of the different activities that are going on in this, in this data set. But the interesting thing I want to show here is let's uh, jump into a trace. Looking at this trace, I'm, I'm trying to understand, okay, what are the heavy parts of this? Um, do I need to do some uh, front end uh, ahead of time optimization on the product, anything like that? Um, so a brief overview of the waterfall here. Uh, we have the bus stop diagram on the left. This is essentially a, a, a call graph. So the root is the, the head of the entire trace. Um, this process Kafka message here, you can see the box highlighted. Uh, over here represents all of these spans are part of processing that message. It goes through a number of steps. And it's pretty clear here that um, converting the event from Kafka to, uh, uh, to its internal format is the, the longest action. There's a database call, another database call, and then it gets shoved into queue and continues getting processed. Okay, so this is a clear story, right? Uh, this is showing that my services, uh, the computational part is going great. It's hanging up on some database calls, no problem. I know that my local database is not very fast. Um, I don't know how this is going to behave in production. Uh, the next step of this story, uh, I got to a place where we're going to try it out in our staging environment. Now, going back to a similar uh, waterfall, this is now a graph from our staging environment. And the thing I want to point out is that it looks quite different. Um, all of the long poles here are sitting in a queue. This one's in a queue. This one's in a queue. This one's waiting to send. Those database calls have vanished. The profile of the application in my development environment was actually quite different from production. Uh, and being able to understand those differences, uh, it, it helps us you know, squash bugs easily, uh, more, more quickly by, by having this, this uh, better understanding of, of what the application flow looks like. Um, I wanted to start with that because it's a, it's a story that, that's recent in my life. This is the last two weeks I've been working on this stuff. Um, and it really highlights one of my, my favorite parts of uh, understanding how uh, I, I build products, and that's developing a mental model of the code that I'm building and how it's going to be running uh, both in my environment and in production. Um, and then 
making sure that that model maps to reality. Uh, there was another stage of this. You know, I, I say that uh, it's sitting in queues a bunch of times here. Um, in my development environment, uh, we noticed it didn't sit, it didn't spend any time waiting in those queues. And the order of events coming in the front door was the same as the order of events that they were getting processed because there was no time spent in that queue. Uh, in production here, because of the variable time spent in the queue, those, that, that processing order got shuffled. So the events coming in the front door because there was a parallel step in the middle, uh, were not arriving at the next stage in the same order. And this was an, an area that actually I did not have in my mental model until I was looking at one of these traces. I'm like, oh, right, I knew that was parallel. Uh, I should have under expected that there'd be some reordering there. Uh, and by, by using the data to update my mental model, um, I, I was able to, to avoid pitfalls that would lead to bugs. Uh, using this kind of data as part of the development process uh, has led to me having a better understanding of what it's going to look like when it hits production and uh, avoiding some bugs that, that would have cropped up uh, as whenever happens when, when you have a wrong mental model. Um, we have a number of methods of getting data from an application into Honeycomb. Uh, the, the best, um, the easiest, is to use an SDK that compiles into your code and uh, you have uh, small bits of, of instrumentation that you put into your code to create uh, the, the spans and fields and so on. Um, going back to the screen here, what we're looking at, when I select an individual row here, um, we're looking at one event that has come from uh, uh, a bit, bit of instrumented code. And you can see on the right, there are a number of fields that describe different aspects of what was going on. Um, some of them are boring, some of them are interesting. Uh, the, the super interesting part comes when you add your own uh, extra data. To, to the in instrumentation that's coming in. I'm looking at a different span here. We have uh, you know, whether Dalmatian is in recovery. Uh, this is uh, the, the period of time after a restart. So it's a flag. It lets us look at the behavior of the service uh, when it's uh, recently restarted versus when it is in its regular runtime. So that's a bit of custom instrumentation that we added. Generally, adding a, a field like that is a single line of code that slips in to the place where you have that information. Uh, and I say that's the best because it is the, the way to get real insight into the, the internal structure of your application and its state as it's doing a thing. Um, going back to the problem discovery bit, the most interesting questions are, you know, I, I'm, I'm experiencing this unexpected behavior. What is it that contributes to that? And having these extra fields describing uh, aspects of the state, such as a customer ID. Uh, notice here we have the, a couple of Kafka offsets. Um, so these fields can all be uh, of any, any type. They're not restricted as a, as in a metric system to um, uh, a few select values. Uh, they accept high cardinality data is our is our catchphrase. Um, Kafka offsets obviously are not unique, but um, uh, they are moving very quickly. Uh, every message is incrementing an offset, so. Um, uh, a single trace will, will have the same offset many times. Each message has its own offset. That's fine. We accept that kind of data natively. Um, so code instrumentation is uh, our first choice. We have SDKs in uh, many popular languages. Uh, we have an agent that can tail log files. Uh, that's really only valuable when those log files are well structured. Uh, now, that doesn't mean they need to be JSON, but they have to have a, a structure. Otherwise, what you're left with is essentially a timestamp and a message. And that's great for sending to a log product um, where you're going to do you know, some enormous regular expression string search across your data. That is not Honeycomb's model. Uh, you can send that data to us, but um, you, you will find that uh, in, unless the messages are all very similar and, and useful for grouping, um, that's not the, the best way to go. But if you are logging structured data, and most libraries, most languages have libraries for logging structured data. The one that we use in Go is called Logris. That stuff parses great uh, and is, is an effective way of using the disk as a buffer between your application and sending that data to Honeycomb. Uh, we do integrate with some uh, logging forwarders. 
I, it's never my favorite setup uh, because there, there's a lot of messy data that gets in there and uh, sending messy data into a service is a way of getting messy data out and that never makes me happy. In AWS specifically, we have a couple of integrations with some of their services, uh, RDS, ELBs. Uh, we have some wrapp wrappers for Lambda that make instrumentation there easy. The long and the short of it is that data winds up at our REST API as JSON objects. Um, and there's a bunch of ways to get data from where it's generated in your application to the edge of our API. So I, I told you a story of, of using Honeycomb uh, in my development environment that was running on my laptop. And then also in our staging environment, um, I, I was calling it production. Uh, that service isn't deployed yet. We were, that, was, that was our staging environment. But I want to talk about like, the, the full process from not just uh, uh, the, the whole process in between you know, my laptop and production. So um, we talked about development, uh, the, the mental model that, that using these tools help you build, um, having the same tools in development as in production. Uh, the next step is, um, is uh, testing and building. Uh, and most of our, uh, we, don't, we don't instrument uh, the individual test runs, but I know some of our customers do. And uh, in a large environment, um, what they found is that the, the flaky tests were, were causing uh, a lot of wasted time, um, but that there wasn't a good way of understanding how to best spend the energy necessary to squash those flaky tests. Uh, because you, know, you can look at a test run and say, oh yeah, that one really annoys me, I'm gonna fix that one. Uh, but without data, you're, you're never gonna be always choosing the right one. So they instrumented their test runs in order to report for each test run the, uh, the time and the, um, uh, and the success rate for those tests. Uh, and then looking at that over a longer period of time gives you the perfect metric to, to use to chase them. You wanna look for the longest running tests that flake the most often because that represents the most wasted time. Uh, using this approach, uh, they were very to, able to very quickly burn down the you know, 80 or 90% of the wasted test time uh, and, and make their tests both more reliable and their developers happier. Uh, we instrument uh, our build process, uh, not the testing part of it specifically, but the, the whole build process. Um, and as a side effect of that, we get information about uh, like the size of artifacts generated and things like that, that let us do some longer term tracking of you know, how are our builds doing? How has our JS bundle changed over time? Um, and and uh, lets us see, you know, oh, hey, when website load time slowed down, turns out we also had a large increase in the, the JS bundle. Um, let's see what caused that. Oh, it was in package we don't actually need. We can pull that out and do some optimization. Um, so tracking the, the build process has actually been really interesting. Uh, when we feel our builds are too long, uh, it's very easy to see using the same kind of tracing model, um, what's the longest stage? Uh, and I, I don't have a, a build for you offhand, a trace for you offhand, but I can pull one up later if you're interested. And what we, what we did was, was create a small uh, product here. This is the GitHub repository for build events. Um, it's focused on Travis, because that's the first place we used it. Uh, we also use it in, in Circle. Um, the idea is that uh, you know, sending, sending events to Honeycomb is, is really just a couple of JSON posts, right? And every step in the build, uh, we put a small binary around that step that uh, takes as environment variables a couple of flags and then um, a couple other bits and uh, effectively creates a span for, for every Travis step. Um, same thing with circle. So it's not uh, like a formal integration. Um, it's just part of our build config. Uh, same as you would use in circle, you know, the, there's an S3 orb that you use to upload uh, uh, results after a build. Um, I, I'm pretty sure we're gonna write a, an orb for build events instead of just requiring the, the Go binary. Uh, but part of, part of the, the, the reason I, I talk about this one is it was so simple. It's not a big complicated, like requiring a, a agreement from all parties kind of integration. Uh, it's, it's just a change to a YAML file 
that pulls in another tool and generates these incredibly pretty graphs about what's going on within our build process. Uh, okay, so after after the build process, um, it goes off to our staging environment. Um, now, I mentioned that we use feature flags, uh, and I, I mentioned it in the context of you were seeing decoration in uh, the UI that weren't that didn't necessarily exist in um, in production. This stuff up here, uh, but we also include the state of flags on all of these events that are influenced by a flag. Which means that using again the, the same tool and the same same style of query, um, I, we've been looking at traces, but really uh, most of my time is spent in the general query engine here. Um, using the same tool, you can look at behavior of a flag on versus off. So, uh, how has the runtime changed when the with the presence of this flag? Um, which users are opting in? Uh, if somebody is writing into support, uh, that's the next step in my. Um, uh, in my discussion of support, but if, if somebody's writing into support, you can uh, see when you're loading a, a, a graph of their experience, um, the state of their feature flags. Um, the use in staging is really not terribly different from the use in production. You know, we're, we're solving all the same sorts of problems, so I'm gonna move on to that. The, the various ways we use Honeycomb in production, uh, first off is feature verification. Um, I just deployed something. Is it working the way that I expect it to work? Right now, for a UI, you might, after you deploy something, load the web page and say, "Hey, does this actually look right?" Uh, you know, sort of a, a last step. And, you know, it's made it through all the tests. Let's let's make sure it's actually going right. Um, that's great for a spot check, and it's even better when you can look at instrumentation that says, "Here is how my feature is behaving across this enormous span of users. Uh, here's where it's errored in this, in this case I didn't expect. Here are the users that were affected. Here are the conditions that created that. Um, so verifying that features that we just released uh, are, are working correctly. Um, that's, again, part of the, the habits that you build up by using the same tools in development, um, because uh, you, you never want to deploy to production blind. Right? You, you don't want to just like trust that everything works there too. You want the same process to go through. Um, hypothesis confirmation, uh, especially around product. This isn't a, a fun story. This is, story is actually from quite a while ago, uh, two years ago almost. Um, events come in the front door of Honeycomb and they are JSON objects. Uh, at the very beginning of Honeycomb, uh, we accepted only flat objects. They could only have top level keys. Um, and uh, if you sent in a nested object, we would just represent the entire nested part as uh, the serialized JSON string. Uh, we wanted to release a feature that says, hey, um, we can allow you to, through the UI, choose to unfurl these events and we'll create you know, sort of new columns based on these deeper objects. Um, but before releasing that, uh, we really wanted to know what is the data that people, people are sending us? Should this be opt-in or opt-out? Um, will we break people's products if we, well, we, will we break people's honeycomb experience if we just, you know, make it opt out and turn it on for everybody? So the instrumentation that we had included uh, some analysis of those JSON objects that were coming in. Um, turns out, you know, most of them were flat because that's what we told people to do. Uh, but there was a percentage that were really deep, four, five, six levels deep. Um, and if we had released that change, making it opt out so that it's automatically on for everybody, that would have really been terrible for those people that are sending, us, sending in those deep objects. Uh, well, the instrumentation also includes uh, the, the team and data set uh, to which these objects were coming in. Uh, so it was trivially easy to generate a list of customers who were doing this so that, I mean, this was two years ago, we were still very young, we could call them up and ask, what, what would you like? Uh, and then use that to influence the, how we built and released the product. So it's sort of the other side of feature validation. Uh, it's, it's making sure that the conditions of the data are correct before you release in order to hypothesize what the experience will be once this feature change goes out. Uh, On-call is a, is a fun one. Um, 
most of our uh, alerts come from Honeycomb. Uh, one of the questions I, I heard at the beginning is what, what's the other tooling that we use? So um, our, our on-call has a uh, structure where there are three, uh, really three sources of work for the on-call. Um, on, uh, all engineers are on-call, we rotate, uh, you get a week on and, and have many weeks off. Um, so the three sources of work for on-call are uh, alerts coming into a Slack channel. These are um, business daytime level alerts. So things that if they happen in the middle of the night are okay to wait until the next day to work on. Um, there's an on-call queue in our uh, task manager that uh, anybody can drop tasks in if they feel something is on-call worthy. This, uh, several of those come from customer support. Um, some of them come from you know, people noticing things are like, oh, this is a problem. I don't really have time to fix it right now. It's a quick fix. I'm just gonna ask the on-call to do it. Um, and the third are paging alerts. So uh, paging alerts, thankfully, are, are very rare. Um, and they come predominantly from our uh, outside end-to-end -end check. I didn't talk about the end-to-end -end check at, at all yet. I really like talking about that. Um, I think there are some public recordings on our website of me talking about it. There are certainly blog posts I've written about it. Um, but one of the things we do to validate that our service is working correctly is uh, have a, a small process outside of our infrastructure, submit events, and then verify that it can read them back. You know, relatively straightforward, but that is our core business proposition. You can give us data and you can get it back. Uh, so if that ever doesn't work, it almost immediately generates a page. Um, that's our, one of our few wake up in the middle of night bowl events. Um, so all of these events I've described essentially come from honeycomb triggers. Uh, the the end-to-end -end check reports its success to uh, a, a, another honeycomb environment, one of our secondary environments that we use uh, in order to have those triggers reliably work when, when production is, is not working. Um, now, because that one's so important, we actually also, in parallel, emit uh, metrics data from that service to a uh, metrics company. Uh, we use Wavefront. Um, I don't have strong feelings about the companies out there. Uh, we have at various points tried out Datadog, uh, SignalFX, and Wavefront. My background is in operations. I could spend a lot of time talking about the differences and what I like about each of them, but uh, that's not really why I'm here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave that there. Uh, so the Wavefront alert uh, also triggers a page, and it's a very simple question. Was the end-to-end -end check able to run? If it was not able to run, then something about that infrastructure is broken. Essentially, it's, it's the watcher watching the watcher. Um, that generates a page. Uh, and secondary, it, it reports the number of successes that it got. And if they fall below a threshold, then um, uh, that triggers an alert. Uh, it reports the number of successes rather than number of failures because uh, we, we want a positive signal that things are working, not the absence of a signal to make us believe that things are working. Um, but we do send uh, some metrics data to Wavefront. Honestly, we look at it very, very rarely. Uh, there are a few people that check the data there uh, from time to time, um, but 90% of our instrumentation comes from Honeycomb. Now, you'll see a lot of uh, discussions on our website about uh, metrics, events, and logs. Uh, and in many of those, we, we discourage people from um, metrics data in Honeycomb. Um, it's kind of weird. Uh, our tool is oriented towards events. And um, if you start at it from uh, a point where you're, you're looking at metrics data, there are a number of our uh, math functions and so on that, that simply don't make sense, right? The sum of CPU utilization is not something that, that makes sense. So we don't have a lot of guardrails in place uh, to control those. But at the same time, we do have some fantastic visualizations of what is essentially metrics data. Uh, this graph here is showing a uh, distribution of the number of spans in each trace coming into uh, one of these services that we're working on. Um, I really like that visualization a lot because of how clearly it uh, it, it shows you not just what's the average, what's the max, what's the min, uh, which are great, but what's the distribution? 
how are these events falling? And you can see that this bottom graph, it's pretty consistent, right? Most of them are about 100, um, and there's a scattering of things below that with a very small number above. Uh, but up here, you know, it looks like it's, it would, it would have a very similarly shaped average, right? The average would basically be a, a flat line in both of these graphs, but the distribution is totally different. Uh, so using heat maps for metrics is actually something we do a lot internally, even though we don't talk about it an enormous amount. Um, I think there's a lot of work for us to do to, to flesh that out because there's such value here. Um, and I'm, I'm sure we'll see some, um, aspects of our product grow in that area uh, in, the, in the future. Um, it, it's, it's changed the way that I look at, at metrics, it, it really has. Um, okay, so getting back to, uh, we were talking about on-call. Um, essentially, the, when, when an on-call alert comes in, uh, the first step that people do is go look at some Honeycomb graphs that uh, help pick apart what, what's going on in the alert. So the alert might be, you know, your end-to-end -end check failed. Okay, well, that's great. Which partitions failed? Did they fail on write or did they fail on read? Um, these are all things that it's possible to shove into metrics, but uh, as you increase the number of dimensions that are relevant, it becomes harder and harder. So uh, that's the magic of, of Honeycomb is that our events are very wide. We encourage you to send a large number of fields associated with each event. Um, I've been talking about the end-to-end -end check enough. Uh, I should just bring it up. So the the step of going from an alert fired to what's going on uh, involves understanding how the um, how the thing is failing, not just that it's failing, but really how it's failing. And getting a deep understanding of that is is going to uh, very quickly draw you to finding a, a solution. Um, so these graphs are, are looking kind of boring because our service is up. Um, but uh, I'm going to click through one of these to, to get to a trace and then show you some, um, uh, some of the fields on the, that uh, are brought up there. Um, and you'll see the UI sort of showing a bunch of uh, uh, garbage looking strings and then it changes to um, uh, more human looking strings. Uh, that's the secure tenancy environment that was on that architecture diagram. Um, okay, so what we're looking at here is uh, a probe going into a partition, and it has some time to issue the write, it has some time to issue the read. This one was successful, it took 289 milliseconds, everything's great. Um, but you can see on one, of these, uh, on one of these checks, it's not only saying, okay, you know, I checked. It says which data set it checked, how long did it take, what was the thing that it found that led it to the uh, solution that, in fact, the check was successful? Um, what was the HTTP status code of the response it got back? Uh, what was the, the ID of the probe that it was looking for to confirm that, in fact, it was working correctly? Um, and then some other information that comes along for the ride. What, what is the, uh, the build of this service that is doing the checks? Um, we often, very often, graph performance across build IDs because when we release a new build, uh, it's, it's nice to see that difference. Um, anyway, this is uh, uh, when, when the on-call check fires, uh, by looking at a trace like this, by having this data at your fingertips, it's, it's a very quick process to get to the place where you know where in code you need to look, and um, you'll carry on from there. Uh, I think there's a blog post that went up recently about, um, uh, specifically about working with the end-end -end checks uh, and, and getting to the, uh, the resolution. Oh, I feel like I've been talking for an enormous amount of time. Um, uh, you did ask about the, the rest of the tools that we use. So uh, I mentioned that we have a metric service that we mostly ignore. Um, we do send our application logs to a Honeycomb data set, in addition to writing them to disk, in addition to having error level log events send alerts to Sentry. Sentry is an exception tracker. Um, they are very good at their job. Um, people ask, you know, uh, well, can I use Honeycomb as an exception tracker? Uh, sure, you can. Uh, and we do, in fact. Um, every, every panic, every exception, uh, they generate events that go into Honeycomb. We can look at them. We get the full context. We can see where they came in a trace. Um, Honeycomb is a generalized tool, right? I've talked about using it in at least eight different situations so far. Sentry is a specific tool 
they are good at catching exceptions and they have a lot of extra uh, things they can do around exceptions specifically because they have a, such a, a, a clear idea of what the data looks coming in looks like coming in. Uh, they can do a much better job of generalizing exceptions uh, to a, a normalized form than we do, right? Understanding where in a stack trace does the uh, memory uh, of the, the function call live and we should ignore that when we're doing our normalization because it's always going to be different. It's still the same stack trace. Um, we don't do a lot of things like that automatically. Uh, they do. So um, we use Sentry for, for tracking our exceptions. Uh, and that's a pretty good part of our development process. Um, we don't have a third party service we use to send logs because um, honestly, we just, we just almost, almost never look at them. So uh, we have, most of our service is set to uh, warn or error level logging. Um, we'll, we'll use the, the logging a little bit more in, in development. Um, I talked about using the same tool set in development as in, as in production. Um, and yet, it's still sometimes useful to, to throw debug log statements around, uh, especially as you're, you're trying to do load tests and things like that. Um, so our, our logs mostly just stay uh, on the, the machines in which they were built. Um, and we do have a number of log tailors running on those machines. Uh, I mentioned we have this honeytail process that can consume different logs. We have those con running to consume uh, a number of system logs, OS query, um, a couple other like uh, security-ish related things so that we get an auditable track of uh, what's going on in machines uh, off the host. Right, that's an important thing. Um, I think that covers the uh, the most of the the main tools. Uh, feature flagging, I, I already talked about. We use LaunchDarkly for feature flagging. They are fantastic. Uh, you know, everywhere I've I've worked before this one, we've had to build our own feature flagging setup, uh, and it's always a pain. Um, but you need it, right? I mean, it's a regular part of development these days. Uh, and I'm very, very glad that uh, there are some successful SaaS companies that have done a good job of implementing the, the client libraries in the right way, such that they fail correctly uh, when the service is down and all that jazz that you just, you have to have when you're using feature flags. So um, huge fans of, of LaunchDarkly. I'm, I'm really glad that we get to use them. Uh, let's see, did I cover most of these? We've talked about dev stage beyond production and incident response. We talked about uh, other tools we're using. Um, I, I'm not going to use that same phrase that you did because uh, I have strong feelings about it. And I think it's a, a distraction from um, how we actually build software these days. Um, but that's a bit of a rant and I, I don't really want to subject you to that unless you, you uh, opt in, ask for that one. <laughs> um, uh, using the tool without much traffic. Uh, so the, the example I was, I was talking about using Dalmatian was, was using a development data set. Uh, there were only, uh, we could see them, there were about uh, eight or 10 queries, eight or 10 uh, uh, single fires that, that had uh, gone into that data set. Um, that's usually the way that I use Honeycomb in, in development, uh, which it, it is a little sad. Um, most of the way that I use Honeycomb in production is around the query builder. It's around you know, constructing breakdowns and filters and uh, calculations in order to understand the bigger picture. And once I have that, finding the interesting bits and then zooming in, and that's when I go look at the trace. Um, in development, uh, you know, I'm only sending a handful of events, so I don't need to spend as much time in the query builder, and I spend more time in the trace visualization, uh, which is fine. There, there are different ways of looking at data, and each one is appropriate in its own right. So looking at large sums of aggregate data is great for production. It, it's not really as useful in, in development. Uh, the thing that I might do is put on a heat map of uh, duration. Um, and uh, actually in this particular data set, it's interesting to compare that to a uh, heat map of the database duration specifically. Um, uh, because we'll notice that uh, the database duration is really almost all of the, the long ones here. Um, and if we include a filter and say, let's exclude uh, uh, meta dot type not equal uh, SQL X, I think that will exclude all of my database calls. Um, uh, yeah, so the, the DDB duration is now empty. Um, 
Well, I guess a bunch of my spans are, are waiting on those uh, calls to, to, uh, to finish. So, um, but I can see for, for each event type here, you know, most of them are, are very, very short. Uh, here's a Kafka write that's a little bit longer because it's my laptop, Kafka is slow. Um, so there are some times when it's useful to use uh, the query builder in, in development, but as you can see, this is, this is a very sparse graph to look at. Uh, the one we were looking at before, um, the uh, heat map, um, this one is, is a much easier heat map to read simply because of the volume of data. Uh, okay, I think I've covered most of uh, most of the, the questions we we're talking about. I've talked about a lot of the different ways that that I use it in production. Uh, I've left out a few. Uh, discovering the long tail of a specific behavior is one of my favorite uses of this tool. It's actually the first one that I did. Um, so I was I was one part of the group that worked at Facebook before coming to Honeycomb. Uh, before helping helping start Honeycomb. I'm not one of the founders, but uh, I was the first employee. And I worked with uh, both founders at Parse and then at Facebook. Um, the f Honeycomb uh, has its its roots in a Facebook tool called Scuba. Um, if any of you uh, have worked at, at Facebook in the past, I'm, I'm sure you will have come across it. And the first project I did using Scuba that really sort of opened my eyes to its value uh, was understanding the long tail of failure cases when customers would try and connect to our load balancer. You know, we'd see a, a smattering of 500s and so on, but we didn't really have a good idea of, of what was going on there until we instrumented uh, a, a check that, that really tried a lot and then enumerated all of the different ways in which it failed. And that changed it from, oh, you know, there's a background of 500s, you know, that's just life. Um, all services are sometimes partially down uh, to, hey, look, here's this one issue type that's causing 98% of those failures. Let's talk to Amazon about it. Oh, hey, turns out that uh, back then when you have e logging enabled on an ELB, suddenly 1% uh, or 0.001% of your SSL transactions will fail. Uh, they went and flipped a switch in the ELB backend and suddenly all of those went away. So in terms of like a, a, a work to, to uh, benefit ratio for our customers, uh, it was enormous. There was just a, an enormous, a whole class of problems that just vanished uh, because we suddenly had the right kind of tool to look at that style of long tail of problems and enumerate specifically what, what are those reasons really uh, without our uh, backend provider getting angry at us. Because you can send those sorts of things in as tags on metrics. Uh, and if you have more than, I don't know, a dozen or maybe a hundred uh, variations in that string, uh, your metrics provider will get angry and call you up or just send you a very large bill. I think that the, the, I mentioned at the beginning, there are many different ways of getting data in. Uh, the first big step is, is using an SDK. Uh, this gives you hooks that are available in your application code at the right places to add the most valuable data. Um, now we have our own uh, uh, SDKs that are very raw wrapper around our uh, REST endpoint. Those are called libhoney. Um, we have a number of uh, higher level SDKs uh, that we call the B-lines, and these serve two functions. The first is they do some automatic instrumentation of common shapes of things. So if you are writing an HTTP service, uh, it's relatively obvious that you are going to want to record the uh, HTTP method that was used. Is it a get, a put, or a post? Um, the URL that's being used, the uh, client-side IP address. You know, there's, just, there's a, a handful of obvious things. Everybody who writes an HTTP service watches them. Um, there's no reason why you need to do all that work. So the B-lines do a little bit of automatic instrumentation. Uh, but more importantly, they offer an API for building traces. And they, they give you this API in a way that's easy to, to work through your existing code base. Um, once you have, so if you're able to use the B-lines uh, and you have that structure in place, you're going to be getting good quality data coming in. Beyond that, um, adding the custom instrumentation around uh, what's useful for your application, it's really hard to give a generalized answer for that because it's dependent upon the structure of the application, the business use case, uh, the, the types of data that might influence execution. Um, you noticed uh, in, in my example there, I had a flag, it was a Boolean. It's uh, uh, in the Dalmatian service um, in recovery or not. Uh, this is a service that 
uh, doesn't maintain state locally on disk, but when it stops and then starts up again, uh, it goes out and, and fetches a number of different um, signals from external sources in order to figure out where it left off, and then it picks up and does all of the backlog of work until it gets to the point where it's now hitting new work, and it switches from recovery mode to normal mode uh, and goes on. Um, because of the way that that application worked, that was a useful signal to include. Uh, so it's getting into that level of detail that um, uh, I, I don't have general advice for you. Uh, in any conversation of a specific service, I could probably point out uh, a couple of good places to, to add flags. Um, it's almost always a good idea to add uh, information about the party that's invoking this service. Now, sometimes that's a user, sometimes that's another org within, another consumer within your organization. Um, sometimes the IP address matters, sometimes uh, you, you might include the, the pod name if, uh, if you're running in Kubernetes. Um, so the, the, the uh, extra color that you add to this uh, basic scaffold of events um, is really where the, the interesting part starts and that's where it's hardest to, to give you good advice. So I, I'm not sure I'm really helping there, um, but uh, at least establishing that uh, setting up a good scaffold is important. Setting up a, a mm -hmm. scaffold for your team to be able to, with very, very little work, um, push in some extra data. Uh, and then once that scaffold is in place, um, uh, adding in uh, appropriate data is, is a good bit. Uh, you're looking at a sublime text window with some code. Um, this is the add event func function. This, uh, its, its main purpose is to um, take an event and push it onto a queue for, for later processing. Um, but we do some instrumentation around the edges. Uh, so this is Go, this is Golang that we're looking at. And uh, the model of context propagation in Go is to use uh, the context.context .context package. Uh, that's where you're, you're supposed to put data that um, not, not uh, bits that your program is going to use, but sort of extra things around it, things like timeouts and cancellation. Uh, you wouldn't put like user IDs in there, but you can put instrumentation in there. So um, we get the context out of the event that was an argument to the function. Uh, we get our, our current span. Now, in many times this span is already uh, available without having to explicitly get it. Uh, this process is a little bit odd because of how it deals with queues. Um, and of course, we have our, our error catching. Um, we, uh, we can make sure that we have a, a span here. This is the code for how you start a span. Uh, it's relatively simple. You start a span, you give it a name. Uh, when you finish that span, uh, it will automatically add the duration and um, the trace ID, it handles all, the beeline uh, handles all of the, the trace ID and parent ID and, and uh, wiring necessary to make it a trace. Um, and then uh, we wanna add a field. So um, this one, in fact, is setting the name to be in queue events. Uh, this is how you add additional context to your, um, uh, to your spans. Uh, and that's really about it, right? So as a developer, the thing that I wanna do is find those, those places that it's, it's super relevant. Um, let's look down here for another one. Um, here we're, uh, we're adding a field that says, hey, um, this thing that I'm looking at is a span. Uh, if we made it through that block, um, uh, it, it is a span. So this, this service handles both uh, events that are not parts of traces and events that are parts of traces, and it handles them very differently. So this is a, a key fork in execution of, of the application. So I wanted to add a field saying, you know, which, which branch of this fork am I taking? Uh, and that's that's the long and the short of it here I you know we we record whether or not we found the trace in the cache um, so we'll see a lot of these little add fields sprinkled through our code uh, that give guidance about what was going on in the state of the application so that when we're looking at something you know we, we look at something and, and says you know uh, oh it, it broke because it couldn't find the trace okay well did that trace come from the cache that's a really interesting question when trying to, to dig out that problem. Um, this is what will tell us whether or not the trace that it was working on came from a cache. So uh, I hope with this example, I, I, I show that the, the instrumentation is actually not onerous once that scaffold is in place. Yep. So um, on this, so if I'm understanding correctly, um, 
in in uh, any application or business application or that you want to sh um, uh, see traces in Honeycomb. If you want to add um, custom fields or um, add uh, um, custom methods uh, to see in the trace, uh, you need to modify the code. Is that correct? If I'm understanding the question right, uh, in order to get traces within Honeycomb, you need to instrument code. Is that the question? Um, the not instrument code, but um, actually modify code versus um, doing something that's more runtime, like uh, uh, like through environment variables, uh, that sort of thing. Um, okay, I. Uh, so there, there's two aspects to generating the traces. There's the automatic instrumentation and the manual uh, augmentation of, the, of that data. Um, what we're looking at here is the, the more manual bits. And Golang, because of its nature, um, skews heavily towards uh, manual bits. Um, the beelines for some of the other languages we support, JavaScript, Ruby, uh, Python in particular, because they are very friendly with monkey patching, um, you can require the beeline and then you get automatic instrumentation. Uh, so without making additional changes throughout the rest of the code, uh, they, they can hook into HTTP and SQL libraries and things like that um, and generate some bare bones traces. That works. Um, they, they do give uh, additional value. I find that the majority of the value I get comes from uh, not allowing the, the machine to just get the boring things, but to really encourage the humans to add the interesting things. Because there's no way that, that uh, uh, just through including a library, you'll actually get the, the most valuable data. Um, and that's true with any, any SDK. Um, that's one of my, my big pet peeves with uh, other um, approaches to this, that uh, the, the attempt to use magic um, especially around like AI and, and anomaly detection and so on. Uh, in my experience, is so often more wrong than not. It, it's just soured me to the whole thing. Um, so that's part of our philosophy is that the developers are the ones that are in control of uh, their product, um, both from development through production, but also in understanding how that product works. Uh, and using that mental model in order to choose the right places to add instrumentation will give you far better results. There, there are uh, subtle differences in the data models between all of the various tracers out there. Um, but fundamentally, you're right, they, they are essentially the same. The, the important actions of tracing are starting spans, adding data to spans, finishing spans, uh, sending those off to a, to a tracing backend. Um, and in fact, you can use the open tracing libraries uh, and send that data to Honeycomb. Um, there are a few subtle differences uh, in the data model. Um, some things work better in, in one than the other. Uh, uh, as an example, um, the, I talked about the beelines having a minimum uh, part of automatic instrumentation in addition to having a tracing API. Uh, the open tracing SDKs do not. Um, there may be other third party packages that use the open tracing SDKs that, that do, I, I don't know about them. Um, uh, so that's, that's one difference. Uh, you get some of the automatic instrumentation with the Honeycomb stuff. There are, there are parts of the Honeycomb UI that work best when we can make some uh, assertions about the, the shape of the data coming in. Um, and so, you know, it, as with any product, uh, if you stay within the ecosystem, you get a better experience, right? Um, it's not strictly necessary. Uh, it's like, you know, using, using Google Maps on an iPhone. It works. You can do it. Uh, but if you are in a contact and you tap on a map, tap on a map icon, right, it's, it's not going to necessarily do the right thing. So there, there are edges around there, um, but we have plenty of customers who do use the open tracing SDKs uh, and are quite happy with them. The method of getting Istio data into Honeycomb involves running a client-side proxy on your end that behaves as a Zipkin sync 
and then you configure Istio to send its open tracing data using the Zipkin format to that proxy. Um, it then can send the data to Honeycomb, uh, shaped in a Honeycomb way. Um, the interesting bit about uh, open tracing and Istio, um, so far as I know, uh, it's not an authenticated protocol, right? So um, you don't have uh, secret tokens that you configure in Istio in order to say to the Zipkin backend, um, I am this customer, I'm allowed to send you traffic. Uh, now, Honeycomb, because we're a SaaS, we need to authenticate. Uh, that's one of the, the difficulties in managing the gap between open tracing and uh, 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 the Honeycomb B-lines. Um, as part of the B-line initialization, you give it your API key and set up some other, some other bits about how you want it to behave. Um, now, some of the open tracing libraries do allow you to configure HTTP basic auth. Uh, I, uh, fine, I guess. Um, I haven't used a HTTP basic auth in talking to a production system uh, in, in quite a while. Um, I know there are some SASs that do it. Uh, so this is, this is part of the, the edge um, with, with open tracing and the SAS model uh, that, that I'm, I'm, st I'm struggling with and exploring at the moment. Uh, actually, the, the next project that I'm, I'm starting up on after uh, working with the sampling thing um, is understanding better what the, uh, the various uh, states of the, the industry look like um, around the various open uh, things that are happening right now. There's you know, open tracing, there's also open census. Um, I'm actually much happier with open census than I am with open tracing. Uh, and turns out uh, they are, they, they, uh, it's not the past tense. <laughs> they are merging. Um, they have claimed to, to uh, have at least started that process. And there are a couple of specs out there that they're like, this is what it's going to look like in the future, but it's still very uh, poorly defined. Um, I think their goal for a, a document that, that lays it out with some more clarity is May. And then their goal for having actual code implementations of the merged product is uh, September, October, maybe. Um, so I, they're, they're actively working on it this year. Um, I'm following that closely. Uh, I know some other folks are at Honeycomb too. Um, I want to, want to make sure that, that we play well in that model. Um, and one of the things that, uh, that they talk about is, is how to deal with um, you know, inter-service uh, authentication. So uh, I, I don't know whether they have concrete answers there yet, um, but it's, it's uh, an interesting area to look forward to. Uh, the one, one point about the, uh, using Istio, since it is emitting spans in the open tracing format, uh, that is a good signal that you should also use the open tracing stuff in your own code so, to make sure that the traces can connect. Um, uh, but uh, in terms of running in Kubernetes, um, I've, I've said a couple of times that uh, you, you really do get better data when you're doing application instrumentation. And at that point, I almost don't care where the application is running. Right? It, it doesn't influence the, the, the uh, infrastructure on which it's running is interesting to add as additional data into the instrumentation. Um, but it's not an interesting uh, signal to use to, to fork about how I would choose to do that instrumentation. Um, as an example, uh, we run predominantly in AWS. Uh, we wanted to play with Kubernetes a, a bunch uh, uh, last year, and so we split one of our staging environments, so it was running half in AWS and half in Kubernetes. Um, we added, flat, we added uh, fields to every one of our, of our events that says, you know, which environment is it in? Um, and then if, uh, you know, if it's in Kubernetes, what's, what are the pod names? Um, uh, and if it's in AWS, what's the instance name? What's the instance type? Um, you know, all of this stuff uh, can be useful, um, but uh, it's it's really more of a of a like uh, a, a sidecar, if you will. Uh, it's it's extra additional information that's helpful, but not one that I would use to to guide a decision about uh, instrumentation. Uh, given my background in, in ops, um, anytime somebody comes to me with a promise of a single pane of glass, uh, I, I turn the other way. 
Um, I don't believe that there's any product out there that gives you a single pane of glass view into everything you need to know. Different products have different strengths, different languages have different strengths, different tools have different strengths. You should use the appropriate one. Uh, just like we use JavaScript on the front end and Go on the back end and some Python elsewhere. Uh, we, we, that's the world we live in and the way we build software these days. That's, that's my take on it.